next speaker and Monica Schleier Smith from Stanford University. Yeah, Monica, please. So thanks for the invitation to present at this conference. Uh, the title of my talk today is Engineering Quantum Spin Models with Atoms and Light. And uh, the work I'll be talking about really uh, fits into the broader program of uh, building in the laboratory increasingly programmable systems of laser-cooled atoms. Um, so I've shown here some beautiful pictures from around the world of um, showing the ability to precisely control the positions of atoms within arrays um, by taking advantage of um, laser light to trap them in optical tweezers. Um, what I'll be talking about today is, uh, I would say, a, a complementary um, challenge of asking um, how much control can we get over the interactions between atoms um, by, and can we reach the point where we can start to program those interactions really with laser light? Um, and in particular, um, we'll be interested in engineering systems where we have control over long-ranged interactions. And by long-ranged, uh, I mean long compared to the sort of micron scale on which one can um, trap and manipulate atoms. Um, and eventually, um, the vision is that these techniques of control over the positions and control over the interactions should start to come together. But our focus will be on the latter for today. And in uh, my laboratory, we actually um, have a couple of different techniques we work with for optically controlling interactions between at, uh, cold atoms. Um, one is coupling atoms to Rydberg states that gives rise to interactions that are um, on the strong on the few micron scale. Um, I won't talk about that today, but you can read more here about some of our work realizing a transverse field Ising model by that approach. What I'll talk about today is a method that gives sort of even more long ranged interactions um, by letting atoms essentially talk to each other um, with the aid of photons within an optical resonator. And this allows us to build um, systems where the interactions can be um, as non-local as the mode of this resonator is spatially delocalized. Um, so why would you want to realize interactions that are um, highly non-local? Um, there are a few different directions um, that, that this can enable. Um, one that is already sort of a well-established um, uh, direction is harnessing non-local interactions mediated by photons um, as a, a mechanism for generating non-local correlations, entanglement, and that can have implications, for example, for generating resources for uh, uh, quantum sensing applications. Um, there are also directions in quantum simulation. There are actually conceptual models in fields ranging from condensed matter to quantum gravity um, that involve um, particles with non-local interactions. And I'll say a little bit um, later about directions uh, uh, of exploring those. Um, and the third uh, kind of class of, of um, uh, uh, motive, source of motivation are really actually classical problems that can be um, phrased as finding the uh, lowest energy state um, of some interacting spin system. So one can sometimes map a classical optimization problem onto uh, minimizing the energy of a network of spins with some non-local couplings. And perhaps if you can build a quantum system that has that graph of couplings, that could give you a way um, to explore quantum approaches to solving that problem. So just to give actually a really concrete example um, from this optimization category, here's a problem that you might encounter in your everyday life. Um, when you're grocery shopping, you have a collection of items um, and you would like uh, the items have different weights and you would like to divide them into two groups um, that are my, my two grocery bags that are um, as close as possible to balanced. Um, there's actually an NP complete problem, which asks given N objects with um, specified weights, is there a way to partition them into two equally weighted groups? Um, if you're a physicist, the way you might tackle this problem is um, you would start by writing down a spin model. So I would define my imbalance between these two sets of objects as um, a, well, I would sit, let each spin represent an object, right? It could point along plus Z or minus Z that says which um, bag I'm putting it in. Um, and then I could define an imbalance, I'll call this FZ, which is a weighted sum of these spins. Um, and that's the thing that I would like to uh, minimize. So I could say maybe I want to minimize FZ or maybe I want to minimize equivalently the square of FZ. And actually, if I write that out, that um, quantity ends up looking like a uh, product, right, of, um, of 
SEI, SEJ of these um, spins on, on different sites, um, where the couplings between these spins are simply the products of the weights. So um, there I've, I've sort of mapped this classical problem onto some interacting spin model, but it's one where every spin talks to every other. So it's a highly non-local coupling graph. If you'd like to start to explore whether you can um, tackle this problem, some ingredients that you would like are these non-local interactions, um, preferably some way of programming the couplings, um, and also the ability to kind of image um, the magnetization to see what state the system ends up in. Um, OK, so I gave you sort of one motivation for engineering non-local interactions. Just to give one other example from the area of quantum simulation, um, these interactions um, appear in conceptual models for asking what happens to information that falls into a black hole. Um, uh, somehow to resolve this information loss problem that was a longstanding problem, um, there a, a, are quantum models that can be written down on paper where information um, that initially is encoded locally very rapidly becomes delocalized or scrambled, as one says, um, across many degrees of freedom. And the models that do this um, are ones that have, um, they look rather exotic. They have particles that can hop in a very non-local fashion. Um, here's, I've written down one um, that is analytically tractable. Um, it's called the Sachda Vyekatayev model. We don't know how to build exactly this, um, but what's natural it turns out to build in the lab are actually models where um, the particles that can hop are spin excitations. If I can engineer a spin exchange process, I can think of that as an excitation that hopped. And if that process can be mediated by light, then this hopping can be very, non, um, very long range. And there's been um, a variety of um, theoretical works exploring whether this type of a model that's similar in flavor to the ones that are known to capture uh, understood to capture the physics of black holes, whether these um, somewhat simpler spin models can realize some of the same phenomena. So how would you build these in the lab? Well, um, the general approach that we take um, is uh, to essentially have, um, we'd like to have an optically controlled process where one atom can um, flip its spin, emit a photon into a resonator, and another atom can absorb that photon and flip its spin. And what we would like um, again, we want it to be optically controlled. So there's some control field um, that drives a Raman process that would flip a single spin if it were resonant. We keep that process off resonant, but design the system so that the pairwise process of flip-flopping by exchanging a photon um, is resonant. So that gives rise to a spin exchange interaction in principle. Um, let's see whether we can see that in practice. So the experimental setup in our lab um, is one where um, so here's our optical resonator. We trap a cloud of atoms in a standing wave within the mode of that optical resonator. Um, so spatially, the atoms are pinned um, to the pancakes of this standing wave. Um, and in uh, most of the experiments, I'll show you that it's a system that's extended um, in sort of a millimeter scale cloud. And um, so if we'd like to start um, seeing these spin exchange interactions, the first thing we can do is uh, so here I'm showing you pictures where each row is essentially showing um, uh, position in this uh, spatially extended cloud of atoms. The vertical direction is showing time. Here at t equals zero, we initiated the system with some spin excitations in this region that I call A. Um, we turned on some light that should turn on these flip-flop interactions I showed before. And indeed, we see that at some later time, the spin excitations appear over here in region B, and then they hop back. Um, and as a function of time, you can see an oscillation locally um, that shows that there are coherent dynamics going on here. Um, one question you might ask is sort of, why is it that these excitations suddenly appear in region B and don't travel in a continuous way in between? Um, and actually everything about this, the, these dynamics, um, we can understand if we know the couplings of the individual atoms to the cavity mode. In this particular case, um, actually, the atom light couplings are strongest sort of toward the left here, and that ended up manifesting in these spin excitations um, hopping over there. Uh, so, so, so the couplings so far are essentially given by the structure of the um, of the the spatial structure of the cavity mode. Um, and I suggested though that what we'd like to move towards is a system where we have sort of increasingly programmable interactions. Um, uh, and, and that could include programming the spatial structure. Do we have an all-to-all -all interaction? Um, do we have maybe one coupled to many or some more exotic um, structure where the, each, each spin looks like the node on a, on, a, on a tree graph? I chose these as examples um, that um, we've looked at 
theoretically that um, could have applications ranging from um, studying that partitioning problem to realizing fast scramblers in the lab. So we'd like to be able to control the spatial structure of the interactions. Um, you might also want to be able to control the form of the couplings. Is it that spin exchange coupling that I described that I can think of as these excitations hopping? Um, or is it the Ising coupling that I described in the context of this optimization problem? Um, and another knob that we'd like is the sign of the interaction. Is it ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic? If you want to solve a hard optimization problem, you'd probably like antiferromagnetic interactions. Um, okay, so we'll get to all of these, but um, I'll start by um, sticking with just a spatial structure that's simply given by the couplings of the atoms to the cavity mode and focus on showing you um, the control we have over the, the form of the interactions and their sign. Okay. So um, again, the, the spatial structure of the interactions will simply be given by the product of couplings of individual atoms to the mode. And so in that case, I can write down a Hamiltonian that should describe the system in terms of some weighted collective spin. Um, and uh, we'll, so the first thing that's kind of nice about this system is actually we have a high degree of control over the spin exchange coupling here that I've called JXY and the Ising coupling that I've called JZ. Um, simply by controlling the orientation of a magnetic field relative to the axis of the cavity. Um, one way to think about this is that I can understand the atom-atom interaction as coming from essentially a Faraday effect, where the magnetization of the spins couples to the polarization of the light, and the polarization of the light can act back on the atoms like an effective magnetic field. If I choose my quantization axis to be the field axis, then which component of the spins couples to the cavity depends on how I rotate the field. Um, and so we can see this effect here that we have an, an Ising interaction if the field is along the cavity, the Z component couples. If I rotate the field perpendicular to the cavity, we have an XY interaction um, because the X and Y components are processing about the field and alternately coupling to the light. Um, so, so you might ask actually, how did I make this graph? Actually, before I go on, I'll, I'll just emphasize also, we, we can tune the angle of the field to control the Ising versus the spin exchange coupling. Um, we also can tune the laser frequency um, in order to dictate, do we have a ferromagnetic or an anti-ferromagnetic coupling? Um, so we have all of those knobs and the way that we actually measure this, one way that we measure it um, is essentially by initiating the system with some spin texture and watching how it evolves. So for example, to measure the Ising coupling, we can initiate some spins pointing along the Z direction, some spins pointing along X, minus X. Um, if there's an Ising interaction, the spins along Z should act like an effective field about which the other spins process. And by mapping out the direction and the rate of that procession, we can essentially um, extract the, the Ising coupling. So that's how, how we um, um, showed this tunability. But, um, you might sort of ask, um, this is all just looking at dynamics, can one also um, prepare a low energy state of the system? Um, and in particular, when I say we can control is the interaction ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic, the question you're usually asking is not which direction will the spins process, but do the spins want to align or anti-align? Okay, so to, to probe that, um, we can adopt a more adiabatic protocol where we're going to initiate the system in a simple spin polarized state, slowly turn on interactions and watch how that affects the magnetization. So what we'll, we'll do is we'll have um, some interaction Hamiltonian um, that we can turn on or off um, by, via the light field, via the control field. Um, but we'll also have a transverse and longitudinal field. Um, and physically, these are actually a Raman coupling um, and, and with some detuning. Those allow us to make an effective uh, field for the spins. And we'll start by turning on this uh, spin polarized state aligned with this effective field and then turn on the interactions. But first, just to orient you, I'll give an example of the non-interacting case. Um, so here, the horizontal direction is position in the atomic cloud. Um, the vertical direction is the tilt of this aligning field. Um, and as you would expect, as we vary um, the tilt of this effective field, the spins um, rotate from down, that's blue to up, which is red. And now um, we'd like to see how this picture changes when we turn on interactions. Um, and so one thing we can do is turn on a ferromagnetic Ising interaction. And um, now as we vary the tilt of our effective field 
and then adiabatically turn on um, with this tilt of the field, the Ising interaction, we see that instead of getting this smooth transition from the spins pointing down to the spins pointing up, we see a very, very sharp edge. Um, and this is consistent with the picture um, that the spins have a ferromagnetic interaction, they want to align, and any small tilt below or above the, above the equator of the um, effective field will break the symmetry between all spins pointing down or all spins pointing up. And we see this knife edge here. Okay. Whereas if we have anti-ferromagnetic interactions, that will tend to um, make the spins uh, want to anti-align along Z or to make the magnetization um, uh, tend towards zero and we see um, this edge wash out. So we can kind of summarize this in a plot of the magnetic susceptibility of our system. Uh, so the susceptibility to small tilts of the field um, in the Z direction. And so the blue curve here is showing the susceptibility um, in the case of Ising interactions, and as we approach a critical strength of the interactions, it's controlled by the light, um, we see this susceptibility to small tilts of the Z field diverge, um, and that's consistent with what we expect for a phase transition between um, the uh, paramagnetic phase where the interactions are weak to a ferromagnetic phase where the interactions are strong. But one interesting thing about this plot is that actually you can realize effective, it appears this same phase transition, um, by having spin exchange interactions, X, Y interactions of the opposite sign. Um, so you know, you'll notice this sort of mirror symmetry where ferromagnetic Ising interactions appear to give the same magnetic susceptibility as anti-ferromagnetic spin exchange interactions. So what's going on there? There's actually um, a nice way to understand this from the picture I gave of thinking of uh, describing the system of spins, individual spins coupled to the cavity as some collective, uh, collective spin that we call F. And in the limit where all of the couplings of the spins to the cavity are the same, we could actually write down an exact relation um, that Fz squared, that's the Ising interaction, is the same as minus Fx squared minus Fy squared, the spin exchange interaction, plus a term that depends only on the total spin. So um, that kind of explains this mirror symmetry of this magnetic susceptibility plot. Now, one thing that I found a little bit sad about this is that um, I suggested earlier that there were problems in many body physics that we might want to explore. Um, uh, and, and to that end, you'd actually like the system not to behave as just a single large collective object. So one question you can ask is, are there situations where this symmetry breaks down and we can see a difference between the ferromagnetic um, interactions of, let's say, the XY type and the Ising interactions that are anti-ferromagnetic? Um, and so it turns out that one way we can immediately see a difference is if we have a spatial inhomogeneity, um, a, a spatially inhomogeneous field. So actually it turns out even without trying um, in our experiment, there's some small magnetic field gradient across the system. Um, so that if we have no interactions and we um, observe the phase of the spins versus position and time, you'll see a phase start to wind, uh, the phase start to wind across the cloud due to this magnetic field gradient. Um, that's in a non-interacting system. If we turn on spin exchange interactions, actually um, this picture looks very different. In fact, it looks rather boring and it looks boring because what's happening here is that all of the spins are actually um, staying aligned in spite of this same magnetic field gradient being present. Um, so just to sort of summarize that, um, here's the phase winding as a function of time um, with no interactions, or also it turns out with Ising interactions, the phase simply winds as a function of time due to the gradient, but the spin exchange interactions completely suppress this phase winding. And the way that we can understand that um, is again, these spin exchange interactions are almost like the Ising interactions, but with this extra term in the energy that has to do with the total spin. So this is telling us actually there's an energy gap between manifolds of different total spin. And so if we start in a spin polarized state, um, that gap actually present, prevents us from reducing the length of the total spin and hence protects the coherence of the spin. And in fact, it's here as a function of the strength of the Ising interactions at some fixed um, time uh, of, of being subjected to this magnetic field gradient, you see substantially higher contrast of the collective spin in the XY than the Ising case. So this, um, idea of using these actually cavity mediated spin exchange interactions to protect coherence um, was pointed out in a very nice paper by um, James Thompson and Anna Maria Ray, where they saw spectroscopic evidence of this, of this energy gap that suppresses defacing. Um, and in our system, we've nicely been able to really directly um, observe the, con the difference between the phase winding in the Ising case and the protection of coherence in the XY case. And this can have actually applications um, 
in situations particularly where one needs the interactions to generate an entangled state, for example, squeezed spin state, the interactions can be used to generate entanglement and at the same time give an added robustness to any spatial inhomogeneities. Okay, so um, that's an exciting prospect for um, quantum metrology applications. I, I want to um, come back to saying a little bit more about uh, uh, kind of what's, what's quantum about all this. Um, because actually some of the experiments I described before, um, you could understand reasonably well in, in a somewhat um, classical sp picture of spins wanting to align or anti-align. Um, here's one thing that is um, we can see in our system that uh, I have no classical explanation for. So um, uh, it turns out we are working, and I sort of hid this um, feature of our system before, but we're working in a system um, where actually the, the spins are spin one. So uh, one experiment that we can do is initialize the system with all atoms in the m equals zero state of this um, hyperfine spin one. And um, if you sort of think about the intuition I gave you earlier of the magnetization of the atoms coupling to the light field, um, you might say that nothing should happen if I start in a state where all atoms are in m equals zero. But actually something does happen. So here's a picture of 100 repetitions of actually the same experiment where we start with all atoms in the m equals zero state. We turn on these spin exchange interactions. Um, and at some later time, we measure what are the populations in the three states. Um, sometimes all of the atoms are essentially still in m equals zero, uh, or many of them. Um, but what you'll see is that uh, sometimes you see have a very large population in the minus one state and a large population in the plus one state, and these are always correlated. And so this is actually what's going on here is that we have a spin mixing process where two m equals zero atoms can turn into a plus one and a minus one atom in a manner that is actually similar to the physics of collisional spin mixing that's been observed in Bose-Einstein condensates and used actually to prepare highly entangled uh, twin Fox states that are of interest for uh, quantum metrology applications. In our case, it's not a direct collision that's generating these plus one minus one pairs, but it's really a process that is mediated by the light field. And that opens up a couple of interesting directions. First of all, for preparing um, very rapidly these entangled states on sort of sub millisecond time scales, um, but also for starting to ask the question, given that the interaction is controlled by light, and extremely long range on the millimeter scale, are there ways that we can const start to control the spatial structure of the correlations um, in a way that is really unique to having these highly non-local photon mediated interactions? So um, the dream is, is to have a system where um, maybe you would be able to control the interactions between arbitrary atom pairs, or, or let's say more modestly, um, where I could dial in um, any translationally invariant coupling graph I want, okay? Um, so, uh, in, in, and that will be cleanest actually in an array of either individual atoms or ensembles. So currently in our system, we have an array of um, 18 ensembles, each with about 1,000 atoms. Um, that gives us some collective enhancement in the interactions. And uh, what we'd like to be able to do is be able to turn on any sort of translationally invariant coupling graph, no matter how long ranged. So um, that might sound uh, very um, ambitious, but actually there's a really natural way to approach this. Um, so the idea is in principle, the cavity mode can mediate interactions of arbitrary range. But what we're going to do is actually, we're going to uh, essentially turn off initially the long range interactions and then controllably turn them back on. So first to turn off the long range interactions, what we do is we apply a magnetic field gradient. Um, so we're focusing here still on this pair creation physics where we start with all atoms in the zero state and we look at what population appears in the plus one and the minus one states, okay? So what I'll show you here and what I'm showing you here on the right is a correlation plot. Um, the horizontal axis is showing um, a particular, the population on a particular site in the M equals plus one state. This is population in the M equals minus one state. And we're looking at correlations um, between arbitrary pairs of sites. Okay, so if we have a purely local interaction, we expect correlations only on the diagonal. And that's in fact what we see when we apply this magnetic field gradient. So we're essentially generating pairs of plus and one minus atoms locally um, on individual sites. Now, um, what we'd like to do is controllably turn back on a long range interaction. And we can do that by applying, so, so the reason this interaction is local, just to be clear, is the magnetic field gradient means that this flip-flop process is off resonant unless the two atoms are in the same position. 
But if we actually apply a control field with two different laser frequencies, then the energy difference between these, these um, two uh, possible photon frequencies allows us to bridge the cost of having a non-local flip-flop process. And in particular, if the difference in Zeeman energies at a particular distance matches the frequency difference in this um, control field spectrum, then we can turn on interactions at that distance. And that's exactly what we see. So here you're seeing um, correlations appearing off the diagonal at a particular distance set by um, the frequencies in our, in our laser spectrum. Um, so that's you know, one particular frequency spacing, but we can also um, do this experiment as a function of the frequency difference between these two control fields. Um, so horizontal axis here is the distance between two sites. The color shows the strength of the correlation between those sites. And you see here that as we vary um, the frequency difference um, between the two control fields, we controllably can turn on interactions at a particular distance that manifest in correlations between the plus one and minus one atoms. And I just want to highlight here actually the level of control. Um, in this particular example, my students decided let's turn on interactions um, at even distances. So first two sites, then they tried four sites, six sites, eight sites, and really precisely at that distance, the interaction is on um, and, and off at all other distances. Now, a neat thing about this is that this generalizes, right? So it's easy to control the spectrum of a laser field. So far we put in two frequency components, but more generally a multi-frequency drive or controlling the waveform of, of essentially my, my laser field, amplitude modulating it, allows what one in principle to make arbitrary couplings versus distance. So this is an exciting direction um, that, uh, for example, has applications to making exotic um, tree graph-like structures of interactions that we expect to give rise to fast scrambling. You can read more about that here. Um, but more generally, I would say um, we're very excited about the prospects for um, having really a high degree of control over non-local interactions mediated by photons. I've shown you programmability of the coupling graph and also the form of the interaction, Ising versus spin exchange, the sign ferromagnetic versus anti-ferromagnetic. Um, and we've started to see how these knobs let us program the spatial correlations um, and also have applications to protecting spin coherence. Um, we're looking forward to applications ranging from engineering spatially structured entanglement with quantum sensing applications to uh, uh, quantum simulations and uh, quantum optimization. And if you'd like to re read more about um, directions in uh, uh, solving the particular partition problem I mentioned earlier, um, our theoretical work on that you can find um, here in a recent paper in the archive. So with that, um, I will thank my team, um, and in particular, Eric Cooper and Avikar Parawell are, um, uh, have done all of the recent work on the cavity experiment building on uh, work by Emily Davis and Greg Benson. And um, I will thank the entire team here and take any questions. Yes, thank yes. you, Monica. Thank you very much. And there's a question from the audience. And um, if the system is on exposure or of random flux or magnetic field, can the field strength be recorded in a programmable way? I'm sorry, was the question, can the field strength be recorded in a programmable way? Okay, if the system is on exposure or random of random flux of magnetic field, you have if you have a random magnetic field on, the, <clears throat> and can the field strength be recorded? Um, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. Um, was it can the field strength be recorded? I think uh, I think they will ask uh, this. Can your system be a well sensing device mm -hmm. for the yeah. external magnetic field? Yeah, so I think one of the interesting questions is um, given what's sort of been done in the area of quantum enhanced sensing has so far primarily been focused on sort of using one collective entangled state, like a squeeze yeah. spin state. And one yeah. interesting question is um, if you want to sense with spatial resolution, um, what is sort of the optimal structure of entanglement. Now, maybe it's just that you want to shorten the range of the entanglement to have yeah. spatial resolution as well as a quantum mm -hmm. enhancement. But maybe you'd like to do something where you're sensitive to a particular spatial pattern and you can actually optimize the structure of the correlations to maximize your sensitivity to that spatial pattern. So exactly what's that that's useful for, I'm not quite sure, but it's, it's an, an intriguing direction, um, I think, to start to ask 
um, what can one do with more complex entangled states in this area of, of quantum sensing? And certainly measuring fields with spatial structure um, is, is a direction that this could go.